teaching series today will result in, by the end of it, you looking like that. Everyone say, ooh and ah. The ladies are like, ah, I'm out, dude. I'm at the wrong church. I don't know about this. Pick the female equivalent of that handsome looking guy. That's, that's funny. That, that's cool. I didn't make that, but it, it, it fits, I think. That's awesome. Okay, we're going to start out by doing a little flashback. Do you remember where you were January 13 and 14 of this year? You guys are like, bro, I don't remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Boom! Oh. oh! I love the audience response. Remember this day, guys? Remember where you were January 13, 14, the ice storm that we had? Jeremy's like, I fell. Anybody else fall during that? That was not a pleasant experience. Oh, man. So this is a picture out of our side window of our house, looking out into our side yard. And this is kind of what our yard looked like, January 13 and 14. And like 15, 16, so I mean, it was kind of a, it was a whole week, right? But this was the worst of it. You see there's a limb that had fallen down. Oh, my goodness. But I want to kind of focus in on one particular feature of my backyard that the January 13 and 14 ice storm revealed. And that was the poor construction of, what does that thing look like? Raspberry rack thing, awesome, yeah. Raspberry trellis, all right? It was not built very well um, when we bought the home back in 2017, 18, whatever it was. We've had some kids in between, time just kind of blurs. Um, that was the trellis that was there. And the wind that we had resulted in that trellis, 4x4 four four post, falling over. Which is crazy, because I'm like, there wasn't even raspberries on it. Like, it's literally two posts and some wire, and like, we'd already cut back the old canes by this point, so it wasn't like there was things on it, but for whatever reason, the wind was strong enough that the weight that was on there with the ice and such caused that trellis to fall over. You see, my raspberry trellis, it was pulverized by wind and ice, by the storm, and is it not true that life at times has a way of pulverizing us? The storms of life, they beat against us and they expose what's in our foundation. The concrete here was poorly laid for my old trellis. And this reveals to us, it's really important truth, of how foundations matter. What we build our lives on really matters and it is the storms of life that reveal and expose either the sturdiness or the faultiness of our foundations. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, hey, anyone who listens to my teaching, follows it, is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. And though the rain comes and the torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's on bedrock. Jesus in this passage, he's speaking specifically to the final judgment. We all one day will stand before God and for those who have built their life on Jesus as their foundation will be just fine will be just fine. But Jesus here, he's also speaking, I think, more broadly, not just to the final judgment, but also to the storms of everyday life and how a life of stability is built on Jesus, his way, his practices, and his teachings. Now, there's different types of storms. If you have ever been to, say, Florida, perhaps, this is a picture of a community in Florida after a hurricane. The reality is, the sort of storm that's a hurricane, it's one of those things that it is powerful, it's violent, it comes through, and it is devastating. You can think in your own life, the storm of a hurricane is like a health diagnosis, or a significant move, the death of a family member, the sudden loss, perhaps the betrayal of someone close to you. The reality is in this life, there are these sorts of storms that come through every now and then, do they not? And it's in those moments of the hurricane sort of storm that we realize what we are really building our life on. Do I really believe the truths of Scripture? Do I really believe in the gospel and the good news of Jesus? Do I really believe that Jesus is the hope in whatever life throws my way? It's in the times of the storm like a hurricane 
that that truth is revealed in our lives. Or perhaps in your life, your storm is a little bit more like this. This is a little bit more familiar for us in the room. This is a picture, of course, of Portland, probably maybe from, I don't know, Pinnock Mansion. And the reality is sometimes the storm of life is just a constant, perpetual, drippy faucet. It's not intense or extreme, but it's just consistent and always there. Perhaps there's things in your marriage that have slowly been dripping at you, or in parenting that's been continually dripping, or perhaps your job, you're like, oh man, every day, got to go to this job and deal with that person or that thing, and it's the constant drippy sort of storm of life. And in light of that, I want to pose a question, is what Jesus said in John 10.10 still true in the storm? By way of reminder, Jesus said in John 10, 10, that my purpose is to give them, his followers, a rich and satisfying life. Rich and satisfying life. So the question, is it possible to have a rich and satisfying life in the midst of this and this type of storm? Is the question I want to ask today. And my answer I want to give us today is a resounding yes, but with a condition. It will not happen by accident. A vibrant, fruitful, life-giving, joyful life amidst the storm will not happen on accident. It will take intentionality and practice. I also want to add another nuance here. What we're talking about in terms of the fruit-filled, good life that Jesus offers, it is not a life that is free of pain or free of worry it is not a storm-free life where there's no challenges and opposition that happens. If that's the thought, I would argue that's a false gospel that actually doesn't exist. I think in a lot of ways in our cultural moment, there is kind of this gospel of like the good life that we have tried to project from kind of American secularized post-Christian culture that seeks to like push away from pain and suffering at all costs, even like binding commitments of my relationships and those cause hardship, like just leave those because like my happiness and joy is the ultimate goal. And the challenge I would solicit to us today is like that vision doesn't actually work. Like it doesn't actually exist. And yet so much in our cultural moment chase after that. And yet Jesus, he offers a life to the full, a satisfying, joy-filled life amidst the storm admits the hardship. And he uses every ounce of that pain and that challenge and suffering to build us and to make us new. That the Christian vision of a, of a response to like the problem of pain is actually a very compelling one, that God doesn't waste the hard, difficult, tragic things that happen in our life, but rather he is with us in it. He is with us in the storm, and he wants to use that storm to build us, to make us more like him. There's different angles to answer the question, like, what is the goal to this life? And for the, the series that we're going to be in throughout basically the rest of the summer, here's kind of how we want to define, like, what the goal of life is, all right? According to Jesus and the authors of the New Testament, the goal of this life is to be made new, evidenced by both the fruit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We need both fruit of the Spirit, and gifts of the Spirit. And for those in the room who are newer to the Bible or newer to following Jesus, and you're realizing, man, there's just like a lot of really weird language that is used around here. Like, welcome to the club. We're so glad that you're here. And we get to learn together to dive into the Bible and the language it uses to describe these really profound and deep and important spiritual truths that are accessible to all. It's not like you got to go to Bible college and get a degree to understand the Bible but rather as we get into the word in the context of community, we seek after God and we ask hard questions about like, wh what does it mean to live a fruitful life like in a storm? And we ask those hard questions. God reveals to us new truth and new depth to that. So we need both. Fruit speaks of the character that God wants to shape and form in us to be more like him. But then the fruit speaks of competence. He wants us to use the capacities and the intelligence and our personality and wiring and our gifting to use those things to advance his kingdom, to add value to people, to build his church, to build our families, to raise kids who love and know and follow Jesus. Like all those things he wants to do through us. 
So fruit speaks to who we are becoming, while gifts speaks to what we are doing. Think of fruit as being, gifts as doing. We need both. In this passage that we just read, where Jesus talks about wise and foolish builders, the reality is we can sometimes look at this as like binary opposites of like people are either in like the wise category or the foolish category. Kind of the goal is to be one or the other. Jesus lived in a binary. He was simply, perfectly wise and good and morally upright and perfect. Like he got that because he had the God card. We, however, it's a little more complicated, is it not? Like there's parts of my life that I would say I'm walking in in some good biblical wisdom, and there's areas that I'm struggling in and I'm learning and growing in. And I think for every Christian, if we're really honest, it is more like a dimmer switch. We are living with the options of wisdom and foolishness, and part of following Jesus and practicing his way is that we're moving closer towards wisdom. We're moving closer towards light. And this doesn't just happen overnight. It takes a life journey. It takes time. So this series we're jumping into, Made New, one of its aims is to get us to walk more and more into the light. But to do that, we're going to have to be ready to wrestle with some of the darkness of our lives, some of the darknesses in our relationship, some of the things that are out of alignment to the way of God as revealed in the scriptures, and in those moments of revelation of, oh, I'm kind of off in this area, I'm not living as wise as Jesus would want me to, have the humility to just admit that, own that, and then move in to the newness in the area of life he's inviting us into. The beauty of this is God wants it way more than we even do for ourselves at times. So we're going to be stepping into some more light. Um, raise your hands if, you, if you've ever done something dumb in your life. Awesome. I love the chuckles too, man. A little bit of, of like self-deprecating laughter is so healthy. All right. So for me recently, this was the dumb thing that I did. I've been running kind of a fast-paced life as of the past several months. There's a lot of reasons for that. I'm trying to slow down a bit more. But one of the things that's symptomatic in my life when I'm moving too fast is little like routine maintenance sort of things start to get kind of put to the side. So I started to hear kind of this weird sound on my Honda CRV's brakes, like the rear brakes, kind of like a <laughs> kind of sound. Raise your hands if you know what that sound is. Keep your hands up if you've had that sound happen to you before. <laughs> okay, I'm not the only one in here. So they started making these weird noises, and I finally got it checked out and come to find that my brake pads, of course, had been completely removed, and it was down to metal to metal, grinding on those rear rotors. And so what should have been just a simple switch out the brake pads, fix, turn into a much more invasive, expensive repair of having to change out the rotors as well. This is a fantastic illustration of how in our life, when we get to moving so fast and we're in such a hurry and our life gets so just bogged down with commitments and stuff, and, and not even necessarily bad stuff. It could be really good stuff, but there's just so much going on that often the really important things somehow get put to the side. Because the reality is it tends to be the most pressing and urgent thing of our lives that takes precedent, is it not? And things like routine break maintenance is something that easily becomes something that is just a second thought. This series we're moving into is going to hit head on what it looks like to practice the way of Jesus, to follow Jesus in the modern world with all the hurry and complexity and overcommitment and high cost of living. I got to work tons of hours. Like, like, is this possible in our modern era? And my answer is yes. But it's going to require replacing of some things in our lives as well as reorienting some things in our lives. We're going to get to that in a moment. Here's a new picture. Where's this at? My backyard. That's right. This is my backyard. Come by with a little bucket, grab some raspberries. We can't keep up with them. Like for reals, there's a ton of them. So since the ice storm, we rebuilt our trellis. We kind of upgraded it. We made a fun little grape trellis here as well. Everyone say ooh and ah. I'll be giving out bids at the end of service if you want one. No, just kidding. Um, but what I did was I rented an auger which is that awesome, like, 
I call it a dirt drill. Charlie's like, that's a dirt drill. I was like, bro, that's really, he's so good with words. It's amazing. It's a, and so we, we went down like, I think 30 inches into the ground, six inch hole, four by four post, concrete. Like that thing is anchored in there, right? We built a better foundation this time around. And what I want to highlight here is that our lives often need new trellises. The trellis is the structure of our life that su provides support for the fruit to be bore. Now you could argue and say, well, Pastor David, if you didn't rebuild that trellis, like your raspberries would have still grown. Like the raspberries out here don't have a trellis and they grow and we pick them and they're yummy. And I would agree with you with one condition. A lot of that fruit ends up just falling right off and rotting. The canes get heavy, they bend over, and that fruit just rots on the ground. So though there will be a fruit-filled life without a trellis, there is going to be way more mix of good fruit and rotten fruit without the trellis. What the trellis also does is it promotes more growth because those branches are able to grow up higher and higher, get more sunlight. And like, I'm not kidding, guys. We cannot keep up with the raspberries that this thing is cranking up. We're bringing some every Sunday, putting in the lobby for you guys. But I say all this to, to simply make the point that what a trellis is to a raspberry patch, so a rule of life. Everyone say rule of life. We're going to get into what that is in a moment. A rule of life is to followers of Jesus. Raise your hands if you use one of these sort of devices to orient and order your life. Some sort of calendar. Um, raise your hands if it's, it, do you use a digital calendar? It's an iCal, Google Cal, something. Raise your hands if you love like a paper calendar. Yes, my faithful paper people. I always find like in my family, we have to decide on one or the other. Because if we get two calendars going, evidently something gets mixed, right? And that's really frustrating. So I put this picture up here to simply say this. The easiest way to think of what your current rule of life is, is your calendar. It's how you spend your time. And there's a continuum there of how structured or spontaneous your calendar is. And, and a rule of life will work in either personality wiring. If you say you're more of a type A, kind of ordered and organized and structured, that's great. If you're more of a type B, kind of, kind of go with the flow, like that's fine. Like the goal of the rule of life is not the rigidity of the structure, but rather it's how that structure promotes a fruit-filled life of abiding in Jesus, of becoming more like Jesus. That's the goal. That's the aim. And so my question to you today, however it is you do your calendaring, how you build and orient and, and organize your life and your time, where is God in the midst of the calendar? How does God fit in to your current rule of life? You see, I bought into this really horrible lie a few years ago, and I just need to tell you about it because maybe you've been here. As life was getting complex and crazy and more and more binding commitments were coming up, as babies were being born, as church ministry, immigrant connection ministry was growing, like I got to this point, especially with young children, like the sleepless nights, they're up in the morning before I am. I got to this point where I was just like, you know what? I don't think in this season of life it is possible to have carved out, set aside time to be with Jesus. I just don't think it's possible. I think in this season of life, it probably needs to be kind of an on the going sort of thing. And I don't know that there's really the possibility of having like carved out, set aside time to just be with Jesus. I need to admit that to you because I was just horribly, horribly, horribly wrong about that. I bought into the lie of our fast, hurry paced culture that says it's not possible. And what I come to, came to find in that season, in my marriage, in my walk with Jesus, in my pastoring, in my parenting, in like all the things in life that really matter, like the core foundational rocks of life, is every one of them was just chipping away. They were struggling. They were becoming weak. And I kind of had this epiphany where I really felt God say to me, and this doesn't happen a lot in my life, to be honest, and I also want to frame it this way. It wasn't like I heard an English, an audible voice from God, this thing. No. It was more 
sensing through words, because I'm a words guy, I appreciate words, that's how God really kind of helps me see and communicate stuff to me, him say, stop giving your family daily or distracted leftovers and start giving them daily liturgy. Moving away from distracted leftovers to daily liturgy. What, what in the world does that mean? What God was saying to me is you need to stop blaming your disordered, unorganized, chaotic, overly busy life on just the way things are, Dave. You're wrong. Order your life around following me more intentionally. Daily liturgy. Daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly rhythms. They're going to help your family bear fruit. It's going to help you bear fruit. And so a big part of this series is helping us as a church kind of lean into that. Because here's what I can just assume. If I need it, and I'm the pastor here, how much more do we all need this? And varying degrees of depth and nuance, absolutely. So the beauty of this series is it fits to any age and stage of life. You can custom tailor it to who you are and how you're wired. And am I single or do I got kids? Am I married? Am I divorced? Do I have a job? Am I unemployed? Whatever. Following Jesus is possible for everybody. But the question is, am I willing to put in the practice of doing it and the partnership with God in it? And that's what this series is going to dive into. Our main teaching text is this, 2 Corinthians 5.17. I would encourage us to memorize this. Raise your hands if you, at maybe some point in your life, used to memorize scripture. That was a practice in your life. Raise your hand if you're doing it right now. Got a couple hands? Okay. I'm not going to put my hand up because to be honest, it's not. But this would be a great one to etch into your mind and your heart. 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is the New Living Translation. Paul says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. What did this passage mean in its original context? Paul is writing to the church at the historic metropolitan city of Corinth. And what he's saying in this passage is, yo, followers of Jesus in Corinth, new ownership is in town. Jesus is now the owner of your life. You do not just belong to yourself anymore. If you are truly a follower of Jesus, born again believer, saved in the faith, use whatever language you want to use, you belong to Jesus. You are his now. So how does your life look different as a reflection of that truth? Followers of Jesus, according to Paul in this passage in the larger context around chapter 5, have a new overarching life mission, and that is to be God's ambassadors. Everyone say, God's ambassadors. All right, so what's an ambassador? In the ancient world, and largely also in the modern world, it hasn't changed too much, ambassadors, they spoke and they acted on behalf of the sending kingdom. They advanced the values and the goals of their king or leader. They had to die to their old way of living, their personalized, individualized goals in order to achieve the greater good of the king in that kingdom. And so Paul, he's applying this picture of being an ambassador to the church. And he's saying, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you are part of a local church, then part of that following of Jesus requires a dying to our old self so that new life in Jesus can take up residence. That's what this meant then. What does this mean now? We don't live in the historic temple or historic moment of, of Corinth back then. We live in modernity in Portland. But what I would solicit to us today is this. Being made new will not happen on accident. Having our lives literally changed. This is the beauty of the gospel. God died for us, not just to forgive us from our sins, but to make us new people. New people, new habits, new ways of thinking, new emotional regulatory skills, like the, what, what neuroscience would call like the neuroplasticity of the mind. Like He literally rewires our thinking and how we see the world to be more like Him, to align more to the Bible. 
as we practice his way. It's mind-blowing. It's amazing. He wants this for us more than I think we even want it for ourselves. But it's going to require both practice and partnership. Practice and partnership. Practice. There's things that Jesus is inviting us as a church to, in, to organize our life around. Following Jesus, it's going to look different depending on your age and stage of life. We talked about that a little bit. If you're in my stage of young parenting, like, it's going to have to be way more fluid, man. Because like you saw today, all of a sudden, like, kid does what he wants to do. And you're just like, all right, what do I do now? Isn't my wife amazing? I'm pointing over here because she was standing right here. Like, we just roll with it, right? So you're probably going to have to be a lot more flexible, right? If you're in a season where um, you're working a lot of hours, you're probably going to have to get creative on, like, where do I craft and carve into my day time to be in word, in prayer, weekly in community, in Sabbath. We're going to get into these practices in this series. But my question for you today, is your rule of life working right now for you? Are you living in and experiencing the results that you want in life and in faith. And again, this isn't, I don't think, a binary question of yes or no. I think it's a dimmer question of like, well, yeah, there's some things, but then there's some things that I want to learn and grow and change in. And so for us in that part of our life, this series is going to speak to shift us and shape us into more light and more wholeness. So this is a practice, but it's a partnership. We do this in relationship with God. And God, like I've already said, arguably wants this more than we even do for ourselves. Romans 12, 2, Paul makes this comment. This would be another passage to memorize. If you want to get into memorizing the Bible, etching it into your heart and your mind, so good. Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world but let God transform you into a new person. Everyone say, new person. There it is. New spouse, new parent, new friend, new child, new grandparent, new coworker, new business owner, new, like whatever label you want to put in there, like he wants to make you new in that. By changing the way you think, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and it's pleasing and it's perfect. I'm going to blow through quickly the eight practices that we're going to dive into for the rest of this summer. The first practice, oh, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, for those who are newer to following Jesus, oh, I'm so pumped you're here because you're going to get to hear and discover Practices that followers of Jesus have engaged in and used for literally millennia now. Like one of the beauties of Christianity is how it is so anchored within history that in what feels like our hyper-changing and complex and moving and transient cultural moment of like, man, the app used to work that way. Now I got to relearn the app. It's changed. Like, like this is such an anchor in history in how followers of Jesus for centuries have lived out their faith. But the cool thing is we get to do it in a nuanced kind of way that fits the, the day and age we live in. It's going to look a little bit different. This is also not an exhaustive list. There are many practices, spiritual disciplines. They've been called. There's a lot of different language for this. There's some great recommended readings that I would give to us. If you enjoy that, audiobooks. If you love Spotify, guys, that got a bunch of audiobooks on there now. I'd encourage you. Make part of your practice as you're rolling down the road to or from work or whatever, the grocery store. Be pumping good stuff in our ears. How much of our time in our formation is just on accident or being done by someone or something else? We think we're this, like, we're the autonomous individual beings that kind of guide our own decisions and, and stuff within what we scroll through. And like, yo, like, our attentions are colonized by so many different people and agendas, right? And so again, following Jesus takes practice. It takes intentionality. It takes partnership with God. Here are the practices. These will give you the hooks to kind of build in your mind to know where we're headed for the rest of the summer. The first is engaging scripture. The Bible is first and final on all things. This is a core tenet and belief of our church, and it so matters to anchor us as followers of Jesus in the modern world. 
where truth is relative and things are flippy floppy and wishy-washy and like how, how can i know like what to build my life on the bible the bible and even with that i'll add a nuance to say the bible is complex the bible is written to different people of different cultures and places over different time periods 2000 years ago we're going to get into some of the weeds on that but this is a matter of faith part of following jesus is putting our faith in and trusting that his word is authoritative and what you have to decide i can't do this for you as for me and my house we're going to serve the lord and do this i would solicit to you this is the best way to do life and marriage and parenting and family and all that stuff is to say, God, I submit my life, my thinking, who I am, to what your word says. And I want the authority, the loving, gracious authority of God's word to shape me. And the practice of engaging scripture, whether we read it, or we study it, or we listen to it. I'm using the word engaging on purpose because there's so many different ways to get into it. Matters, first and foremost. Second, and Ken hit on this beautifully last week, and actually did a great job at kind of walking us through how to do this, which is amazing, is praying scripture. A lot of times in our life, we're just like, I don't really know what to pray. I get distracted when I pray. Like there's so much of the biblical story includes prayers of people. Read the Psalms. A lot of the Psalms, I don't want to say most because I don't know if it's most, but a good chunk of the Psalms are just prayers. Prayers of David, prayers of this person, prayers, and, and how they're wrestling with and, and trying to shake out their trust in Yahweh, trust in God, amidst suffering and complexity of life. If you've gone through loss or tragedy, yo, read the Psalms. They are your lamenting and grieving prayer language. And so we're going to pray scripture as a practice. Number three, Sabbath. What is basically a speed limit to the hurry of life? What is God asking us to give a portion of our weekly time for the purpose of, get this, dual purpose of rest and worship? The purpose of Sabbath is rest. Deep soul, mind, body, spirit level rest. And that will look different for different people. The goal here is not to kind of straight jacket the practices to say it's got to just look this way, but rather is to say, Yo, it's the trellis, it's the structure, the goal, and the purpose of these practices is fruit. It's becoming more loving people, more gracious people, more joyful people. People with a greater sense of peace and patience. Oh, parenting, we need patience, right? Like, that's the goal of these practices. And God has woven into the cosmos Sabbath as a key component of being a follower of Jesus. Silence and solitude. So you get a chuckle and you're like, bro, this, I don't live with a moment of silence and solitude in my life. There's constant noise and movement and this and that. Silence and solitude speaks less about the external environment we're in and way more of an internal state of being. In other words, kind of the goal here is to quiet and still our mind and our heart, which for me takes like dozens of minutes to actually get to because there's so many things i'm thinking about and worrying about like like the moment you finally have a moment of silence like what does your brain do it goes to all this stuff right and so part of the practice of silence and solitude and however often you want to practice this the goal is to one by one give those things to god until finally i've got my my state of being to like a place of homeostasis and i could just like chill there right but unlike Eastern mysticism, the goal for Christians in silence and solitude is not an emptying, but a filling. And so now I fill my mind with these things. Scripture, the word of God, prayer for people. Like the whole goal of silence and solitude is to be filled more with the presence of the spirit of God. That silence and solitude. Fasting. What is a speed limit to time and pace with sabbath so fasting is a speed limit to desire human desire is infinite and the obsession and the disordered appropriation of human desire be it sex or food or money or experiences or things or like whatever part of the practice of fasting is to put a speed limit to it and to recognize and to honor kind of the infinite nature of human desire 
in the words of C.S. Lewis, the fact that we have infinite desire of which cannot be fully satisfied this side of heaven is itself evidence that we are made for a different world. And in fasting, to get closer to God, dependent on Him, and to acknowledge, God, all the things I hunger and crave after, you're the ultimate. I depend on you. I need you, God. And in fasting, cultivate a dependence in God. Generosity, part of following Jesus. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And following Jesus absolutely has something to say about our money and our possessions and how we appropriate those. And I realize in a church setting with so much scandal and misappropriation of money and all this stuff, you're like, dude, mind your own business. We're actually going to do a teaching series called that, Mind Your Own Business. It's going to be on money. And we're going to talk about how every person, yeah, some of y'all are chuckling. I just like to lean into, just name the elephant in the room, man. That's just how I roll. Like each of us, we have a business we run. It's called our home. Whether I'm single or I have a bajillion kids, it don't matter. We are responsible to steward well what God has given us. And part of that stewardship is creating margin to live generously, to support the mission of what God is doing through the local church, missions, other sort of God-advancing, kingdom-advancing things, but also just margin just to be generous, to say like, man, there's a birthday, and I really want to get something for that kid. I can go do it and not have to wonder if I can pay my electric bill. And so part of the practice of generosity is ordering my life and my finances around God's priorities of God, family, church, community. We'll get into that in a moment. So that we can be agents of his renewal and his gospel in our city. Generosity. Number seven, grieving. There's not a lot kind of spoken in the church on this topic. It's a little bit out there. But so much of the biblical authors actually talk and kind of lament and just kind of say the things that they grieve through, the varying layers of loss of a loved one, a parent, a spouse, a child, a sibling, a friend, um, a season of life, uh, 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 an economic business venture. Like, we are continually in a state of grieving something. The question is, am I grieving it well? And how does following Jesus actually help me move forward in that grieving? In the words of Pete Scazzaro, when we don't grieve our losses well, they get buried alive. And at other points in our life, perhaps things that maybe even we lost or, or experienced decades ago, they just start welling up again into your 30s and 40s and 50s. Like, is there a better way? And the answer is yes. Grieving with Jesus. We're going to get into some of that. And then last, number eight, community. We're built to belong. There's kind of this DIY spirituality idea that's really popular today of like, man, you just got to have like a really good kind of teaching pastor podcast and then like a version Bible app plan. Like you're good to go. Like you can follow Jesus and be a Christian and do that. And I would argue, sure, you can do that. But, but how is that helping the local church grow in advance? How is that adding value to other people? The beauty of the church is when we show up to like a Sunday gathering or a camp out or a life group or justice work like with Immigrant Connection, like it's both a, something I get and something I give to it. And my critique of the kind of DIY spirituality movement is it's a whole lot of get, but it's not very much give. In other words, in a local church, I get both experience of getting something, I get a sermon, I get a worship experience, but I get to give something. I get to serve and disciple kids. I get to help set up for potlucks. I get to, like these things that don't seem that amazing and like flashy, but they matter because they're adding value to other people. And we're most like Jesus when we serve. So community as an eighth practice. There they are. And you might be thinking to yourself, holy smokes, Pastor Dave, I'm already overcommitted, over busy. You just stressed me out more. Thanks for adding a bunch of stuff to my already crammed schedule. And if that's where you're at, I want to encourage you to say, to say, don't feel like you have to tackle all of these. The reality is I think we're really good at setting these goals of like, man, New Year's resolution, I'm going to get fit and run a marathon. It's like I set this goal when I'm right here. And what happens is I make it to about here, and I fall off the wagon. Rather than overestimating what can be done over a year, 
Why not practically decide what can be done today? Perhaps it's a five-minute thing. You spend five minutes today. I'm going to purposefully open my Bible to the Psalms. And whatever I open to, like, that's what I'm going to read. And then I'm going to pray it. I'm going to do this for five minutes. Everybody in the room can do that. And if you don't read, you can still do it because there's Bibles that read to you. And for reals, if you're like, technology is frustrating and I hate it, help me out. Like, find someone here that looks like they're like, I don't know, under 40. And like, they will help you figure that thing out. And maybe you're under 40 and you don't know how this thing works. Like, go talk to Chris in the back because he just raised his hands at me. <laughs> He'll get you set up. There's so many ways to engage the Bible. You might be thinking, yo, like, it's summer. Summer eats schedules for breakfast. I'm like, I'm with you, man. It's true. So let this be an experiment. One of the cool things this summer is that things are a little bit more chaotic and ad hoc and schedules are crazy and all these pool parties. And... So maybe pick one of the practices. Say, you know what, this summer, I'm just going to experiment with one of these in a daily fashion or in a weekly fashion. Experiment. The cool thing about experiments is it's not a huge commitment, huh? You try it for a season, did it work or not? That's like the scientific method. That's the whole point of doing experiments. It's say like, I have a hypothesis that I'm going to grow to be more like Jesus, have a more fruit-bearing life by doing these things. I'm going to try it in this way, do it for a time, and then get some feedback from other people. A lot of times we're blind to the fruit that God is producing in our own lives because we are so stuck in self-negativity and self-hatred and shame and guilt, are we not? If we could just kind of name what is true, we often are in that place way too much. And to be clear, the Bible is clear that guilt is a tool to lead us to repentance and to closeness with God. Once we've repented of that thing, we've said no to it, God, I'm sorry. We've made some decisions to kind of like change our lives to actually live differently, like it's done. If there remains guilt for that thing, that is not from God. It is from Satan. And it wants to keep you feeling like you can't be close to God and drive you away from these practices. Satan is already one. If already, all you have to do is not do these practices. He's already won. Because Satan knows these are the time-tested true pra Jesus practiced these, like, like these are the vehicles of the way. It's the trellis, it's the structure by which we live a fruit-filled life and we advance the kingdom, we depopulate hell. And he hates these. So if anything, if you did one of them, if you did some of them, it's new territory in your life for the kingdom. God will grow new fruit in you. Think of your life as a Lego. These are my Legos from when I was a kid. My parents are awesome, and they save, like, all my stuff. My dad actually had to build a shed, because he's like, I need room for my tools, man, all your stuff. Um, let's say this Lego represents your life. How many spots are on the Lego? Four. How about on the bottom? Four. Arguably, four and four is? Oh, how many practices are there? I literally just made that connection. I didn't plan that. That's really cool. Okay. So, your Lego may already be like this. Because I'm really trying to make this super relevant to how life works. Because I think anything else is a waste of time. Um, how many do I have here? Do I have eight? Oh my goodness, I just... It was kind of crazy getting out of my house today. Um, every day is, yeah. I believe my kids for more stuff than I should probably. Okay. So you may have eight spots in your Lego, and they might already be full. It's your job. It's your kids. It's your friends. It's your hobby. It's your yoga class. It's getting boba tea on Thursday. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know what your schedule is. I don't know what your current rule of life is. But part of what this series is going to do is it's going to invite you to do two things. It's going to invite you to replace things in your life, and it's going to invite you to reorder things in your life. And these things are just natural, normal ways of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Okay? You've got saved. You've made a commitment you've been born again, like use whatever Bible language you want to use. By the way, if you've not experienced that, I would love to chat with you. That is the first step in following Jesus, is becoming his apprentice, his disciple, following 
him being forgiven. But then for the rest of our life, there's going to be the need to replace things. Um, maybe it's a blatant sin that just needs to go away. Maybe it is. Um, maybe it's a time waster. It's like, man, the amount of Candy Crush I played last week. Whew, like five hours. Or like pick your, your thing, right? Time waster. Maybe it's a money waster. If you were to look at your like bank statement at the end of the month and you were to highlight kind of some key spending things, you'd be just like, bro, that was just like way, way, way too much going to Carl's Jr. or whatever. Like there might need to be some replacing, some removing of those things and then replacing them. So instead of a whole bunch of Carl's Jr., maybe it's getting on a more disciplined budget and saying, I'm going to purposely decide to make some margin to put into savings or to pay down debt or to plan for that vacation I want to go on that I normally would have gone into debt to do, but no, I'm going to do it cash, right? Like if we're talking in the financial area, there's some things that you're going to do to replace. And now I've just replaced it. Perhaps with time wasters is like instead of just when i'm exhausted at the end of the day and i'm tired and i just want to like i want to escape is a lot of i think the endless mind scrolling we just want to like get away from it all like instead of that which is easier to do i'm going to purposely carve out a moment and a place and a space to actually engage those things with jesus in prayer for five minutes then go to my candy crush <laughs> but 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 you see what we're doing we're taking baby steps. We're doing something we would not have otherwise done to get results that we're not ever going to otherwise get if we don't make some hard decisions to replace things in our life and reorder things in our life. Reordering. This is a little bit different, okay? Let's pretend that we got mostly things kind of good in our life, but they're just unorganized. They're chaotic, they're scattered. This is a conversation of priority, by the way. So with reordering our life, I would argue this is the best way to do it. God, family, church, community. So God, growing, facilitating faith and love and obedience to who he is and what he has revealed in his word. That's one of the points of the practices, engaging scripture, praying scripture, Sabbath, silence and solitude, community, all these things, right? Building God as the core of our lives. But then the close second is family. And I would argue I'd put it in this order. For those married, your marriage is your number one family or number one priority in your family. The greatest gift you can give to your kids is a healthy, godly marriage. And that will not happen on accident. What you sow into your marriage is what sows into the culture of your family. And so as we as spouses get close to Jesus and, and with each other in conversation and work through hard stuff, so we give our kids a greater gift. And then parenting, like my family's chosen to do this. I'm not saying this is the way to do it, but the way we arrived at this decision to homeschool our daughter was there's 800 hours a year that you gain when you get to be with your kid during the week in those hours. And that number just kind of floored me. I was just kind of like, man, like, like she had a great experience at public school last year. It was awesome, great teacher. Like it wasn't any of that stuff, but it was more like my wife and I really sends Jesus to say like, like just give this a shot. Try it for a year. Take that time to invest in your daughter. And I, I'm a little bit scared, to be honest, because I'm like, how's that going to fit with work and life and ministry and immigrant connection, all this stuff? And part of it is what, what we're talking about here. He's like, Dave, there's going to be some things that got to be replaced from your life and some things that are reordered in your life for that to work. But this matters. Your marriage matters. Parenting matters. What else? Your job Work was before, not after the fall. Work can be worship. Even if your job is something like monotonous and like you're tired of it, how can I, in following and practicing the way of Jesus, do so in a way that actually advances his kingdom in my job place? The church, serving, giving, building, community. Okay. We're going to wrap this up. The number one question I'm going to leave us with because the reality is, there's a lot of great things we can talk about from here, but like, 
showing up to church on a Sunday morning like doesn't change our lives, right? Like, I put a lot of time and effort into this. This matters. Keep coming to this. But this is an instigator. It is a catalyst for the rest of the week. Question is, do I want God to make blank new? If you're here today and you're kind of like, my life's good, life's great, whatever, like, that's fine. And you can still come, by the way. And I would love for you to come, actually. Like, that matters. I want to honor where you're at in your state of mind and all that stuff. But I would also follow up and say this. We are either growing or we're dying. It's one or the other. There is no state of, like, perpetual fermentation where I'm just being the same. I am either moving, in C.S. Lewis's words, to a more heavenly creature or more hellish. So kind of my critique to that would be, okay, I'm glad that's working good now. I doubt it's going to stay that way in a week or in a couple weeks. We are continually, part of being human means to be changing. And so what does God want to make new in your life? It's your marriage. It's your job. It's your parenting. It's the way you see your work. It's the way you spend your time. It's the way you spend your money. It's your pursuits. I don't know. For me, I've already told you, it's moving away from distracted leftovers to daily liturgy, creating healthy, helpful, structured, yet flexible rhythms and systems for my family. That's me. I'm not saying that for you. You do you. You got to figure this out with Jesus. But I would just invite you into a moment of prayer. We're going to wrap this time up. To say, Jesus, thank you for how you died on the cross to forgive us of our sins and to make a way to be in relationship with you through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the indwelling of your Spirit. And God, I thank you for this beautiful congregation who together is chasing after your invitation to us to invite our community, starting here with those in the room, to belong to Jesus, to believe in Jesus, to become like Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to each person in the room today, tomorrow, soon, as they take some purposeful time to do an inventory with you, what is the key area of their life that you want to make new? And then I pray that you would show them a key practice that's going to be the best fit and make the most sense in terms of about being the, the trellis, the structure, to produce the fruit and the goodness in that area of their relationship with you. And let it be that. Let it be a partnership. This is not just we go off and do these things, but God, rather these things, they're a means, they're a, a way to connect with you and be more mindful and aware of who you are and where you're moving and working so that we can live a fruit-filled and a gift-filled life for your glory. Thanks in advance, Jesus, for how you're going to move in and through this series. And thank you, Jesus, for your commitment to us in this. That you want this more than we even do for ourselves. Because, like you said in your word, it brings the Father glory that our lives would bear much fruit. Thanks, God. We love you. We're learning to love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Amen.